Morning, everybody. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes here um, and might as well, if you can, uh, grab a pen and pencil and um, a calculator uh, because I'm going to be asking you to do some computations and some work on some examples in connection with today's presentation. So we'll get started in just about a minute. Thanks. Okay, good morning again, everybody. Uh, welcome to our, our advanced workers' compensation webinar series, which we call the Breakfast Club. And thank you for all tuning in today, Thursday, instead of our regular Friday session. Uh, we are all attending a CLE tomorrow as an office, and uh, so we appreciate everybody being flexible and tuning in today instead of tomorrow. If you do have friends who were unable to attend today, Please let them know that we'll be doing an encore presentation tomorrow. We always record the webinars, so um, if you want to uh, access to a recorded webinar, that's always available. Um, but how, we're, tomorrow, we're actually going to be replaying the recorded version at 9 o'clock like we would normally um, hold our um, advanced webinar series. Today's topic is Global settlements, you're on fire. You, uh, global settlements, section 32 says settlements using your burns um, obligation and um, lien reductions. Uh, so we're gonna be doing a lot of computations today and before we got started, um, for those of you who are on the um, call at that time, I did ask that you grab um, a pen or pencil, some paper and your calculators because we're gonna be doing a lot of examples today, a lot of calculations and lean um, calculations and then some examples on um, uh, your lean reductions. So everybody um, has some hopefully um, implements to be able to do some calculations and you get your coffee and we'll get started. Um, as you know, hopefully from being able to attend the presentation on Monday when we talked about basic third party issues Section 29 allows two avenues for recovery. Um, it, you can both pursue a worker's compensation claim and pursue a third party action if you sustain a work injury under certain conditions. And that has to be that um, somebody else's negligence, somebody not in the same employee caused your injury. So if you get rear-ended while driving in connection with your job, um, and uh, you can show that the other party was negligent and that person was not a co-employee, you can both sue that person for negligence and you can also collect workers' compensation. Uh, but in the law, there's a maxim, um, which is that for every one injury, there is but one recovery. So although you can pursue both actions, if you're successful in, in collecting on both actions, there has to be a mechanism in place to, excuse me, to uh, prevent what we call a double recovery. And the way we accomplish that 
and under the statute is that the carrier or the employer is given a lien against past benefits paid versus any recovery from the third party action. And the uh, employer and carrier is given a credit against future payments due. So people often interchange the terms lien and credit. And uh, I know that none of you watching today are going to do that from this day forward, if you ever did, um, because they are two totally different concepts. A lien is a recovery for benefits previously paid, and a credit is a right that you enjoy against future benefits. So think of lien as being a recovery for things that have happened in the past, and your credit is what uh, you are relieved of having to pay into the future. Today, we're going to be talking about both your lien and your credit rights um, as we discuss how to value a Section 32 when you're um, hopefully doing a global settlement at the time of consent. Okay, so the first thing we need to do in, uh, in our process here for determining what amount you might be willing to contribute to a Section 32 as part of the settlement of a third party action is to calculate your lien recovery. And your lien recovery is not as simple as just totaling up the payments that you've made for both medical and indemnity. Uh, you have to um, reduce your lien by uh, the costs incurred in effectuating that recovery. In other words, you have to um, contribute to the attorney's fees that the plaintiff or the claimant will have to pay as a result of obtaining a recovery on that third party action. Right, so your lien recovery will be the percent cost of litigation, which is a comparison of the costs incurred in, in obtaining the recovery versus the gross amount of the settlement, multiplied by your gross lien. And that will lead to your recoverable lien. Um, one of the big challenges in third party, um, um, working with third party actions is understanding the lingo. So if you can get the lingo down after today, then you're gonna be miles ahead of most other people in the state in uh, understanding third party actions. One of the things, one of the terms that you should become familiar with is the cost of litigation. And again, the cost of litigation are the costs compared to the gross amount of the settlement. Oh, just for your um, reference here too, in, in, the, in the presentation today, if the heading has a, is a blue co color and there is this um, little, um, you'll see the icon there for a, a little white, not a stick figure, but a, um, a nondescript white figure with a calculator. That's a formula. And then examples, as you'll see on the next page, will have, um, or excuse me, not on the next page, but um, in a couple of slides, um, examples will have a pink heading at the top. So the first thing we need to do in determining the percent cost of litigation is to determine what the costs are. And costs are the attorney's fees that are um, charged against the recovery plus disbursements. Disbursements are necessary expenses um, in effectuating the recovery. Um, it's, it's generally when you're ballparking your um, recoverable lien, people will take off a third off of their lien because by and large in New York, uh, contingent fee settlement arrangements are a one-third of the recovery for the attorney. Um, but when we get down to the real nitty-gritty here in doing um, consent letters and in calculating the value of a Section 32, um, attorneys for defense attorneys and plaintiff's attorneys will get down to the hundredth um, uh, the hundredth of a percent for um, determining um, contributions towards fees. All right, so to determine costs, you need to determine what the attorney's fees are plus disbursements, which are things like um, court reporter fees, um, service of process fees for when they initiate the lawsuit, um, obtaining an index number from the court, and those types of things. I always um, demand an itemized list of the costs from plaintiff's attorney. I don't just accept uh, their representations to me as to what the costs were in effectuating the settlement. And I have um, hopefully an example that I'll be able to show you here. This is an actual uh, cost sheet that was presented to me in connection with a third party recovery. And it was exorbitant. There were $12,000 
in costs that these uh, this plaintiff's attorney um, said that were um, required in effectuating this a settlement. And that was a, an extremely high cost, especially compared to the amount of the settlement, which was $90,000. So I demanded, as I usually do, a detailed itemized list of the costs. And as I went through it, I discovered that we were being, uh, that they were charging costs to the file, which are not reasonable. Um, for example, they charged uh, legal research for one of the attorneys who works at the firm. That's generally considered to be part of firm overhead. And then even more egregiously beyond things like um, postage, this particular claimant was not reliable and he had um, fantastic, I guess, um, injuries. Dam so they, were, they knew that they had a good damages claim, but he was extremely flighty. Um, I've defended his compensation claim as well, so I, I know this individual very well. And he stopped uh, going to scheduled doctor's appointments, and so the firm that was representing him on his third-party action started assigning associates to babysit him, basically, and to bring him back and forth to doctor's appointments and to the workers' compensation board for his hearings. And then one of the things that appeared to me that they were including as part of their disbursements were uh, the um, attorney's time for babysitting this individual. So they would have uh, like an hourly rate associated with the cost for this individual to be taken back and forth to his doctor's appointments. Not a reasonable cost. So always make sure that when you are determining the cost of litigation and as part of your due diligence, you're obtain, you should obtain an itemized list of the disbursements and take a look at them to see whether or not those costs are reasonable. If you have questions about what is reasonable, um, I'd be happy to um, take a look at those for you um, when you have a specific example. So after we determine the total costs on the file, which are attorney's fees plus disbursements, to figure out the percent cost of litigation, you're going to divide the, the costs by the gross amount of the settlement. Okay, so that'll give you the fraction of what the costs represent versus the entire settlement. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. This is where you need your pens and pencils and calculators. So I'm gonna use this particular case as an example. We had a gross settlement of $90,000 out of that itemized list of disbursements, I determined that $4,044.61 of those total disbursements were reasonable. The fee, therefore, was $28,651.80. That fee is calculated by subtracting the disbursements of $4,044.61 from the gross settlement and then applying a one-third contingent fee arrangement. And how the fee is calculated is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes the fee comes off of the gross settlement. More often, it comes off of the uh, settlement less disbursements. And it's governed by the fee arrangement that the claimant has with his, his, his or her attorney. So we determined, therefore, that total costs are $32,696.41. And that would be the disbursements plus the fee. And so my question for you, therefore, is what is the percent cost of litigation? And remember that percent cost of litigation, the formula for that is uh, costs divided by the gross settlement. I'll give you a minute to calculate that. Okay, and if you did your calculation properly, you divided $32,696.41 into $90,000, and you came up uh, with a percent cost of litigation, excuse the typo there, of 36.33%. Okay, there shouldn't be a dollar sign there. So the percent cost of litigation on this claim was 36.33% of the total recovery of $90,000. It's usually going to hover around a third, um, especially in New York, given that um, our contingent fee arrangements um, are, ge are generally limited to a third of the recovery. 
um, this can be different uh, depending on the type of action. Medical malpractice actions uh, can top out at 25%. So it is important to know the fee arrangement that the, the, plain, the plaintiff slash claimant has with his or her attorney. All right, so now that we know the percent cost of litigation, we can calculate what the recoverable lien is. To determine your recoverable lien, you take your gross lien minus costs associated with the lien recovery, and that will give you your recoverable lien. Uh, another way to put that is it's your gross lien minus your gross lien times the percent cost of litigation, and that gives you your, your recoverable lien. And really what you're doing when you're determining what your recoverable lien is, is determining what you're, what you're entitled to recover um, after you pay attorney's fees associated with the benefit of recovering your lien. So you're going to have to pay uh, costs for your lien recovery in the same proportion that the plaintiff pays costs um, against the gross recovery. So because the plaintiff pays a cost of litigation for his or her recovery of around 33%, you are going to have to um, reduce your lien by the same percentage um, because you need to pay for the attorney's fees and the costs associated with that uh, recovering your lien. So recoverable lien is uh, calculated by taking your gross lien minus the costs associated with the lien recovery, which will be the gross lien times the cost of litigation, and that gives you your recoverable lien. Another way to express this formula is to um, think of it as it you're being your gross lien multiplied by the percent cost of litigation. And that gives you the cost associated with the lien recovery, and then you subtract that from your gross lien. Okay, so let's do um, another example. Let's assume that you, um, for the, and this is the same example that I've been, that we um, have been dealing with so far um, during the presentation today. Let's assume that the lien at the time of the recovery was um, indemnity benefits had been paid of $30,569.59, medical benefits of $34,893.42 for a gross lien of $65,000, $463.01. We'll use the same percent cost of litigation that we just calculated by dividing the costs of the litigation by the gross amount of the recovery of 36.33%. And so to determine the recoverable lien, you're going to take the gross lien and multiply that by the percent cost of litigation and then subtract that from the gross lien. So the first thing we're going to calculate are what are the costs associated with the lien recovery? In other words, what's the attorney's fee that you have to pay? in order to recover your lien of $65,463.01. Give me a minute to do that. Okay, and hopefully you all came up with $23,782.71 are the costs associated with the lien recovery in this claim. In other words, that's the fee, the attorney's fee and the disbursements that this carrier would have to pay in order to recover their lien of $65,462.01. You can think of it as though there was a recovery of $65,463.01. Say that was the um, recovery from the third parties. Um, that was the total amount of the recovery you would have to pay attorney's fees and costs associated with that. And so you would pay them at the percent cost of litigation of 36.33%. So your lien is going to be reduced by $23,782.71. And that brings us to our next example. So your recoverable lien, again, will be your gross lien minus the cost associated with the lien recovery. And that gives you your recoverable lien. Or another way to put that is that it's your gross lien minus the gross lien times the percent cost of litigation, and that gives you your recoverable lien. So we'll do a quick example on that. Your, um, there, actually, this one is sort of self-evident, so I didn't leave a spot for um, you to do the calculation since you already pretty much did the calculation. The gross lien was $65,463.01. The cost associated with the recovery um, that's a typo there. It should not be $32,696.41. It's the calculation that we just did. 
$23,782.71. That subtracted from the gross lien of $65,463.01 would give you the recoverable lien of $41,680.30. This slide here uh, will give you the actual calculations from the consent letter that I did with these specific numbers. So if you um, access the, uh, or would like a copy of this PowerPoint after the, um, after the presentation, um, which I recommend just for going through the examples, I'd be happy to give it to you. Um, and this, this slide will bring you through all the calculations that we just did. In order to know um, how to value your Section 32s using um, your future liability, which could include a Burns obligation, which we'll get into a little more in depth in a minute, uh, you also need to know the credit. Okay, your, the, 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 your future obligation cannot be, um, it cannot be limited by any more than the credit available to the claimant. Um, so the, it's, it's important to know what the credit is uh, because you cannot benefit to a greater degree than what the credit is and your lien recovery. Um, frequently, um, when I first started doing this, um, plaintiff's attorneys would try and argue that the future benefit to the carrier or to the employer was the future value of the worker's compensation claim without reference to whether or not the credit was sufficient to completely offset the future liability on the worker's compensation claim. So they would come up with fresh money calculations when we were still working under Kelly um, which would be grossly over, overvalued. They, the, the workers' comp claim might be worth $500,000 into the future, but the claimant's net recovery was only $100,000. And they were basing the future value to the carrier as the future liability on the workers' compensation claim as opposed to limiting it to the credit that was available to the claimant. Um, so it's very important to calculate the credit because people sometimes lose sight of the fact that um, future, your future obligations um, could exceed the value of the credit, um, and uh, they are most. Your future benefit is most certainly limited to the value of the credit. So you don't want anybody to be arguing or in t uh, positing to you that your um, the future benefit that you have as after a third party action exceeds the value of the credit that's available. To determine the amount of the credit, um, and again, this is a formula, so the title's in blue and we have our little icon with the calculator. You take the gross amount of the settlement minus total costs, which are disbursements and fees, minus the recoverable lien, which is money that the claimant has to repay to the carrier or the employer, and you get the net settlement, which is also known as a credit, which is also known as an offset, and which is also known as a holiday. Um, there are many different ways that people re refer to uh, the um, future benefit that you're relieved of having to pay as a result of a plaintiff or plaintiff's um, recovery from a third party action. And you should know that any of those terms are interchange interchangeable, net settlement, credit, offset, or holiday, but definitely not lien. You cannot have a lien against future benefits. That's not the right term, so please don't use that term, and you'll do yourself huge favors because not only will people be impressed at the level of uh, knowledge that you have about third-party settlements, but you'll also be making sure that you're distinguishing between your two benefits that you can obtain from a third-party recovery, which is the benefit from have, uh, recovering past benefits paid and uh, the benefit of being relieved of having to pay future benefits. Okay, so to determine the credit, let's do an example. We had our gross settlement of $90,000, total costs of $32,696.41. So that was the disbursements of $4,000 and change plus the attorney's fee of approximately $28,000 gives us total costs of $32,696.41. That's payable to the plaintiff's uh, personal injury firm. Your recoverable lien we calculated at $41,680.30. That was the gross lien less the um, uh, percent cost of litigation, um, and which gave us your recoverable lien. And the net settlement will therefore be the difference between 
uh, $90,000, $32,696.41 and $41,680.30. So let's calculate what the net settlement or credit or offset or holiday to this plaintiff is going to be. Okay, hey, and presumably everybody calculated that the claimant's net settlement or credit that's going to be available to the employer in this particular example is $15,623.29. Not a huge credit. Right? So the gross settlement was $90,000. Attorney's fees and disbursements were 32 and change. The recoverable lien, which was the repayment to the carrier, was 46 and change, which let leaves... $15,623.29 for the claimant. So the value of the future benefit to the carrier in this claim is at most $15,623.29. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at calculating lien, recoverable liens and credits, let's move on to discuss burns. As James uh, discussed on Monday when, we, when he uh, presented our um, basic third party issues presentation, Burns versus Variale um, was a decision, a, a very monumental decision from the Court of Appeals, which held that permanent partial disability benefits are, um, are distinguishable from death benefits permanent total disability benefits, and schedule loss of use benefits in workers' comp, and that they are speculative. Um, we all knew that, um, even when we were doing Kelly calculations before Burns came along, um, because with a permanent partial disability calc uh, uh, benefit, there are a number of variables that could come into play, such as the rate itself could change if the claimant had returned to work, for example, um, because presumably their earnings would um, fluctuate. Uh, the uh, rate could change because a uh, permanently partially disabled claimant could go in and out of work and the weekly rate would be dependent upon a medical rate when he was out of work and, and to an actual reduced earnings um, calculation when, in, when, when actually working. Um, a permanently partially disabled claimant could become more disabled, um, not I mean, I, it was, I argued it when I argued Burns that somebody could become less disabled, although I'd never seen that before. Um, and most importantly, uh, the duration of the benefit could change. Um, a permanently partially disabled claimant could be found to not be attached to the labor market, which would then mean they would not be entitled to a benefit um, at all. And so because of the nature of permanent partial disability argument uh, benefits, um, we argued in Burns um, that um, the benefit was speculative and that you shouldn't base a reduction of a lien at the time of a third party recovery on extinguishment of those future benefits since it was too speculative. And the Court of Appeals agreed. <laughs> the Court of Appeals maintained for certain kinds of benefits, um, um, the, the application of Kelly versus the state insurance fund, which um, says that if the future benefits are not speculative, then it is appropriate to take into account the future benefit to the carrier or to the employer at the time um, of a recovery in determining uh, what attorney's fees should be paid. So Kelly basic uh, versus the state insurance fund involved a death claim, which um, you know, involves lifetime benefits to a widow with the possibility of remarriage. And there's a table actually that takes into account the likelihood of remarriage supposedly, but um, that is what we use. And um, so those benefits are not considered speculative, whereas Burns argued that because the benefits were speculative, you could not base calculation of the attorney's fee associated with the credit um, on the future benefit. What the Burns Court did not hold was that the carrier was relieved of having to pay an attorney's fee associated with the future benefit. 
with the credit, with the holiday, with the offset. Um, what, what the Burns Court said was that you cannot try and determine what that future benefit is at the time of recovery if it's a permanent partial disability um, kind of claim. Um, there has to be a different way. And the different way that has evolved following the Burns decision is that we, we do a pay-as-you-go kind of analysis. So in other words, what Burns does is it requires reimbursements of attorney's fees that the plaintiff or claimant has essentially prepaid at the time of the recovery because the recovery to the claimant is reduced by the full amount of the attorney's fee. And as the carrier or the employer realizes the benefit from the credit or the offset or the holiday or however you want to characterize it, except as a lien, um, it is at that time that the carrier or the employer pays the attorney's fee associated with that benefit. So in other words, um, no, I'm missing a slide here. Um, for, in other words, oh no, actually my example will, um, I think, the, do a good job at, at showing how the Burns contribution is paid. Um, the Burns contribution, and this is a formula, so this is the, um, the mechanism by which you determine the attorney's fee associated with the credit as it's realized, is you take the same percent cost of litigation that we use to determine um, our fees and, the, and costs associated with our lien recovery, and you multiply that by the amount of the credit realized, and that's going to be your Burns contribution. Another way to think of the Burns contribution is it's your attorney's fee on your credit. And you don't pay that attorney's fee until you realize the benefit of the credit. So Kelly used to allow the parties to determine the amount of the attorney's fee on the future benefit to the carrier at the time of the recovery. Burns says if it's too speculative to determine the future benefit, then you need a different way to uh, calculate the um, fees that should be associated with realization of that benefit. And the way that this has evolved is that as the credit is realized, the Burns contribution or the fees associated with that credit are calculated at that time. Let's take a look at an example. Let's assume that the net settlement, and I'm not going to talk about gross settlement because it's not relevant at this time for determining your Burns um, contribution. Let's assume that the net settlement to the claimant or the credit available or the offset available or the holiday that's available is $100,000. Let's assume that this is a standard case with a contingent fee arrangement of a one-third and there were no disbursements, so the cost of litigation is a straight third, 33 and a third percent. Let's assume that after the recovery, the claimant incurs $1,000 in medical costs. What will the Burns contribution, and let's not like bring variables into the analysis, like whether or not the $1,000 in medical costs were appropriate under the MTGs, or whether or not those were $1,000 in medical costs um, payable pursuant to the fee schedule. Let's assume that the $1,000 in medical costs were appropriate per the fee schedule and covered by the MTGs. What would your Burns contribution for that $1,000 benefit to you be? So because there is a credit, you're not gonna have to pay the $1,000 in medical treatment because you have a credit, but you will need to pay for the costs incurred in obtaining that credit. So what will the Burns contribution on a $1,000 credit be? Um, I'm sorry, I jumped to the wrong spot in the, in the um, presentation. I'm using the presenter view, which is the, for the first time. The Burns contribution for not having to pay a $1,000 medical uh, fee on a case where you, there is a credit available to you, if the cost of litigation is 33 and a third, will be $333.33. So if the claimant uh, is able to bring 
medical rec receipts to the board to demonstrate that he or she paid out of pocket $1,000 in medical costs and that med med the, the treatment was appropriate pursuant to the MTGs and was um, payable per the fee schedule, your Burns contribution under this, the, the facts that I've given you here in this example will be $333. Those are the costs that were incurred in obtaining that $1,000 credit for you. And the costs um, are reflective of the cost of litigation um, overall. Let's do another Burns example. Let's assume that there's a net settlement of $100,000. So the holiday credit offset is $100,000. Let's assume the same percent cost of litigation of 33 and a third percent. And let's assume that following the recovery, the claimant is entitled to an, a reduced earnings award of $600 per week. And there are no questions about whether the claim is attached to the labor market or whether the rate will be variable. What will your Burns contribution be per week based on an award of $600 per week for an RE award? To calculate your Burns contribution, you're gonna take the percent cost of litigation times the amount of the credit realized, and that gives you the Burns contribution. This is a pretty simple example here. Your Burns contribution, if somebody's receiving $600 per week in awards and the cost of litigation is 33 and a third, your Burns contribution is gonna be $200 per week. So in other words, the benefit to you is that you didn't have to pay $600 per week in an indemnity benefit. And so you need to pay for that benefit. You're going to pay for that benefit in the same proportion that the everybody that the, the the plaintiff or the claimant paid in, in in obtaining the recovery, which in our situation was a third of the gross recovery, and so you will pay for your benefit at, at the same uh, percentage. All right, so let's talk about section 32s and burns. If you can reduce your recoverable lien by the amount of your expected future liability, which could include your Burns contribution, then you could settle your case by Section 32 agreement at the time that you give consent to settlement. And this is a great time to settle your case because the, the plaintiff is generally facing a long period of time of um, having to absorb a, a, a credit despite how, I mean, even if it's a small credit, like the one that we've looked at already of only $15,000, um, it's still going to be a pain in the neck for them to have to keep the receipts, keep coming back to comp court um, in order to um, realize um, the um, Burns obligation or the Burns contribution against that credit. Uh, so it's a good time for them to settle their case. Um, it's also a time, I believe, when uh, plaintiffs, um, because they're facing the unpalatable um, to them um, reality that they need to repay uh, the workers' compensation lien, um, that it's a mechanism for them to, to, to recover part of the, that payment. And it turns out, I think, to be a, a psychological incentive um, to the plaintiff to, to want to settle their case. I mean, obviously it's great for us because you, you eliminate the obligation to have to, to make a continuing burns obligation, the administrative expense of having to keep the file open, of potentially going back for hearings and defending the file. Because honestly, like if you have a case where the claimant's receiving a, a temporary partial disability award, you're gonna wanna continue to defend that award with arguments like labor market attachment and IMEs uh, to minimize the amount of that ongoing payment uh, so that your credit doesn't get eaten up as quickly as it otherwise would if you just assume or just conceded that benefits were a total. So um, uh, ob uh, obtaining a global settlement at the time of a recovery from a third party action um, by settling the workers' compensation claim via lien reduction um, 
and or some additional cash, depending upon what your future obligation is, is it's a very attractive time to settle the claim. So let's take a look at how we could accomplish that. Um, and again, this is a formula, um, and, um, and it's, a, a, I guess, a roadmap for you on how you can um, make these or perform these calculations on your own cases. So to value a burn Section 32 agreement, take a look at what your recoverable lien is, subtract from that the expect, your expected future liability, which could include burns payments, and that will give you the amount of the lien reduction that you should accept in lieu of a full recoverable lien or potentially an additional cash payment if the amount of the recoverable lien is insufficient to cover your expected future liability. I confuse myself with that. So let's take a look at an example. Your, let's assume that the recoverable lien is $100,000. So this is after reduction um, of your gross lien was a hundred and some odd thousand dollars. Um, but let's assume we've already taken into account the attorney's fees and costs of the disbursements that you would pay on your lien. And so your actual recoverable lien, what you should receive um, out of pocket from the claimant is $100,000. Let's also assume that the claimant has a net settlement of $200,000. And so the gross settlement must have been somewhere in excess of $500,000 or so. Let's assume a percent cost of litigation for simplicity of a third, 33 and a third percent. The claimant has been classified at $600 a week with a 75% LWEC. And at the time of the recovery, 100 weeks out of the 400 PPD weeks that a claim, the claimant would be entitled to from a 75% LWAC have elapsed. So in other words, we have 300 weeks remaining at $600 a week on the indemnity on this claim at the time of a recovery. Let's assume there's no medical complicating this claim at all. And so what I'd like you to do is to calculate what, your, what you should recover as a lien or what cash payment you should make in order to settle this claim by Section 32. Okay. Remember, to calculate that, we're going to take your recoverable lien minus your expected future liability, which could include burns payments, and that will give you the amount that you should reduce your lien to or the cash payment that you would make. So here, your recoverable lien minus your expected future liability, which could include burns payments. So here we have $600 a week, 300 weeks remaining on your PPD. Your burns obligation is going to be $200 a week for 300 weeks. So in this example, a reasonable outcome on this claim would be to accept a lien recovery of $40,000 for a Section 32 agreement. So you take your expected future liability, which in this claim will be your burns obligation on the ongoing PPD benefit, and you subtract that from your recoverable lien to get the lien recovery of $40,000. So you have 300 weeks remaining out of your 400 weeks at $600 per week. You would need to make a Burns contribution of $200 a week for those 300 a week, or excuse me, for those 300 weeks, because your Burns a contribution on an indemnity payment of $600 for a week is going to be $200. So 200 times 300 weeks, is $60,000, you subtract that from your, so that's your expected future liability. That's your, and, you, and in this claim, in this example, your expected future liability includes your Burns contribution. 
there is a sufficiently large enough credit, $200,000, to absorb the full amount of the credit, or the, excuse me, the full amount of the permanent partial disability benefits that are due into the future. And so a reasonable resolution of this claim by Section 32 at the time of the recovery would be to reduce your recoverable lien by your future obligation for your Burns contribution of $60,000 and accept, therefore, $40,000 for a Section 32 settlement. I'm just going to open up the, um, I'm going to unmute everybody just to see if anybody has any questions about that example before we go on. So I've either stunned you all into silence or hopefully you're all under, you, this is, this is all elementary stuff and, um, and, and well, you're bored beyond board. belief, but understanding. Okay, so let's move on, and I'm going to leave everybody un, um, unmuted. There was a, another example. Let's assume in this example that your recoverable lien is $50,000, and the claimant's net settlement, in other words, the credit that's available to you is $200,000, and our percent cost of litigation is 33 and a third. And this one, there's a larger future potential, there's a larger future liability. This one, the claimant's been classified with having, is expected to be classified with an 85% LWAC. The claimant's not classified at the time of the recovery, but it's a reasonable expectation that the claimant will have an 85% LWAC, which would lead to 450 weeks of PPD at $600 a week. What would you, what should you accept as a lien recovery or what additional cash should you be willing to pay in order to settle this claim by Section 32 agreement? I think $40,000 we should pay. That's excellent, Mark. Okay, your future liability on this case will be the 450 weeks times two, $200 again, which would be your uh, Burns contribution for the ongoing indemnity payment. That's $90,000. And again, in this example, we're assuming that there are no medical expenses. So your expected future liability in this case would be $90,000. And the credit is large enough to accommodate that entire future PPD benefit. So because your burns obligation, your anticipated burns obligation is $90,000, you would reduce that future obligation by, the, by your recoverable lien of $50,000, and that leaves you with a deficit of $40,000. So in this case, you could get rid of an 85% LWAC with a $600 PPD rate for an additional cash payment of $40,000. Does that make sense? The only thing that confuses me was when you say the holiday of $200,000, where does that come in? The, the credit is um, determined by taking the gross amount of the settlement minus the attorney's fees minus the lien recovery. And so one of the things that's important to keep um, segregated when you're doing these kinds of analyses is don't think of the net to the claimant as being um, a number that can, that can uh, change depending upon what your lien recovery is. So in other words, like sometimes it gets confusing. Like if you're thinking to yourself, well, if I take fifth, if I only take back, uh, $10,000 out of my lien of $50,000, that actually means that the claimant's going to get an additional $40,000 from the recovery, and that's going to change what my anticipated future liability is because the claimant will have a bigger credit. What you really need to do is to treat these two things as completely separate. So take a snapshot of what the situation is like at the time of the recovery 
and determine what the claimant's uh, net rec recovery is or the credit or the offset without consideration as to what the future liability is and your burns obligation or anything like that. And then deal with the case on a go forward basis once you've determined what, uh, how to address the past benefits paid with your lien recovery. Does that make sense? Sort of. Okay. I'm going to, I, I, I the, one of the things that's challenging about third party actions is uh, it's like the more you know, the more confusing it gets sometimes. Um, and so um, what, what I think is very important, and I think I've actually included it in a slide later on, and we're going to look at a, um, a claim as an example where we're going to take it through from the beginning to the end. So we're going to determine the percent cost litigation, we're going to determine the recoverable lien, we'll determine the credit, and then we'll determine the burns obligation, and we'll determine what you should do for a 32. Um, and one of the pieces of advice that I give when we do that example later on in our presentation today is that you treat the calculation of your recoverable lien and the amount that the claimant's going to receive as a credit as a completely separate and independent analysis from what your Section 32 obligations are value should be. Okay. Let's take a look at another burn <laughs> section 32 um, example. Hey, Melissa. <coughs> yeah. Um, Melissa. Yes. Uh, just a credit, uh, just a question on your um, PPD examples where yep. you have a PPD exposure for future um, liabilities. What if you paid into the ATF? The PPD is it still the future is still speculative under Burns? If you already paid the you know the full present value into the P, uh, ATF, I mean, how does that affect your third party negotiations? Um, so that should be part of your lien if you've already paid into the ATF. So and that and and presumably, but like, it's not paid. It's not paid out to the claimant. So is it part of our lien? It's not been paid out to the claimant. We've paid it to the state. That's an excellent question. I would have to look. I would have to research that. Um, you're not supposed okay. to actually have to make a deposit into the ATF while you have a third party action pending. So the fact Correct. that Correct. right, the fact that you have a an ATF deposit it's probably not going to come up is an issue then. Well, I <laughs> I wouldn't put the past the board to, to direct an ATF deposit, even though there is a third party action pending. Um, you know, but but you can. But it it would be a unique situation for sure, because if the third okay. party action is pending, then there shouldn't be a direction to make a deposit into the ATF. That would be an interesting case, though. I'd love to love to. if you have that situation. I'd like to know about it. <laughs> Okay, so let's thanks, take a look. Thanks, Alino. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all right, so let's take a look at another example. Um, let's assume that your recoverable lien is $25,000. The claimant's net is only $50,000. The percent cost of litigation is a third. The claimant is anticipated to have an 85% LWEC with 450 weeks of PPD. And this is where your skills um, you know, and, and your knowledge on workers' compensation claims will come into play. Like you'll be able to negotiate uh, what your lien reduction should be or your cash payment should be based on your skills and being able to predict what the LWEC is going to be. But let's just assume that it's pretty well established that the claimant's expected to have an 85% LWEC in this claim with 450, 450 weeks of PPD benefits at 600 weeks. If you wanted to settle this claim by a section 32, what should the amount of your lien recovery be or what amount of cash payment should you be willing to make in order to settle out? And again, let's just focus on the indemnity. So it sounds like our burns obligation is $90,000 again, and you take that $25,000 away and we have to contribute $65,000. I don't know if that's correct, but that's what I come with. So in this case, the holiday, though, is only $50,000. Okay, that's what throws me off here. Right, so we have 450 weeks of PPD benefits at $600 per week. So let's just take a look at what that future, the future liability on the comp claim is going to be worth. 450 weeks times $600 per 70. week. 
Yeah, so you're looking at future indemnity liability on this claim of $270,000. So this is why it's always important to keep in mind what the credit is. Because in fact, we're not, we're not gonna get a 90,000, and we're not gonna have to make a $90,000 Burns payment on this case because there isn't going to be a credit a sufficient to absorb um, the entire PPD benefit. So in this one, the, the $270,000 in future indemnity payments that we're facing, the, they will, those payments will fully absorb the credit that's available of $50,000. So that's real money though, that we should have available to us, $50,000. So you reduce the future exposure of $270,000 by the credit of $50,000 and you have a recoverable lien, sorry about that, you have your recoverable lien of $25,000 which could be applied to reduce your future liability on the case. And so under the example that I've given you here, there, there really is no Burns obligation. I mean, there could be, but it would be limited to the first $50,000 in credit. And then you would get the, the, you would have liability for the remaining PPD benefits. So in this case, you should be willing to cough up cash of $195,000 to settle the indemnity. You get the full benefit of the credit of $50,000, reduce it, reduce the overall exposure for indemnity benefits by your recoverable lien of $25,000 for an overall reduction against the future liability for indemnity of $270,000 of $70,000 for a cash payment of $195,000. Example you're number basically four. paying for your but you're basically paying for your full exposure though. I don't know if I would settle for $195,000. Right, and that, that's, I've, I've eliminated that's, that's those kinds of, do. right, I've eliminated those kinds of variables in, in the examples that we're taking a look at. The other thing that you might want to take into account is that, um, you, you know, by paying money now, it's money now is worth more than money later, so you would want uh, potentially, you know, a, dis a discount for the money that you're willing to pay now against your future liability. Um, like we get with the present day value of money, um, you know, any, any, any potential, um, I guess, issues and litigation as to whether or not the $85,000 is actually an accurate reflection of what the LWEC is going to be, uh, you know, whether you have any arguments of fraud or labor market right. attachment. I know those are all things that would go into <laughs> your, to your um, calculation yeah. as to what you would be willing to pay, but just based on a straight up money. Yeah, but in the Right, and that example though, when there's no burns um, um, complication, if you will, um, I wouldn't settle for 195 because I would just let it run its course and and settle for a lot less than that. So I I would think that's just my thought. Right. Um, some some might be willing to pay the a, a lump sum on that case um, because at, at an 85,000 or an 85 percent LWAC you would face the mm -hmm. potential for the hardship redetermination. Um, so it, it, it's, it, it's it, again, it's, you know, different organizations and people have different philosophies on settling cases. And, um, you know, just from looking at it from a purely monetary perspective, you would at least want to any, you know, take, reduce any potential section 32 value that you would come up with in that example by $75,000, which would be the full amount of the credit and your lien your recoverable lien if you were going to settle it by 30. Right. Right. So let's take a look at our fourth example. We have a recoverable lien of $50,000, net settlement of $50,000, a percent cost of litigation of 33 and a third. And let's assume that the claimant is expected in the future to have a schedule loss of use of 50% of the leg, which is 144 weeks at $600. What would your lien recovery or cash lien recovery, in other words, would you, what would you be willing to reduce your lien to, or what kind of cash would you be willing to pay in order to um, settle this case? Um, 
I hope I did this right, but I think we should have a recovery of 13,600. That's right, Mark. Um, <laughs> you're, you're very, that's very, that's excellent. It's, um, can you, you want to explain how you got to the 13,600? Well, the, the, the loss use was 80, 86400 and we had $50,000 uh, recoverable lien and a $50,000 holiday. So that's $100,000 minus 86400 comes to thirteen six. I don't know if that's correct on that. Right. It's th thirteen six is is the difference between um, what you what your lien recovery what you would be entitled to as far as your recoverable lien and the credit. All right. So what I wanted to point out to you in this example, though, is that if you're thinking about this as a Burns case, please realize that schedules are not considered Burns cases because a schedule loss of use is not a speculative award. Right. So, I mean, if at the time of your recovery, you have schedule opinions and uh, you're able to determine what the schedule is going to be, you should not be reducing uh, your lien by the amount of fees associated with uh, the, the, the schedule loss of use because you're just entitled to a credit against the entire schedule loss of use because it's determined to not be um, a speculative award like a PPD award. So in that instance, the board has held that you just get the full credit right away um, against the entire schedule loss of use award. So it'd be 86,400 minus your 50,000? That's how you get to 36,400? So the uh, schedule is 144 weeks times the $600 per week. So that's, yes, an overall schedule loss of use award of 86,000. $400. The credit is $50,000. You have a recoverable lien of, oh, so that, so subtract the $50,000 from the $86,400. That gives you $36,400 remaining as a payment. And I have a, an error in my calculation here. Mark is right that your lien recovery should be the difference between the $36,400 that I have listed here as lien recovery because that's the difference. That is actually the difference between the full schedule award and the credit. And so then what you would do is reduce your recoverable lien by the $36,400 for a lien recovery of $13,600 in order to settle this by Section 32 agreement. All right, I'm not following this one. I mean, um, lien recovery as of $36,400 is, is not correct, correct? Right, that's what I just said. Yeah, okay. So that's actually the difference between the full schedule award. There, yeah, how's that? <laughs> no, it, it's 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 actually your potential future. So in this case, the uh, schedule loss of use award is worth the eighty six thousand four hundred. Mm -hmm. And uh, the um. You would reduce holiday, that 50, by, yes, by your by your by the fifty thousand dollar holiday, which would give you the thirty six thousand four hundred that I had listed here. Remaining that is, that is your future liability. Right, remaining as your future liability for the schedule, you would take that thirty six thousand four hundred minus the fifteen uh, fifty thousand dollars that you have available to pay for your future liability, and so if you accept you already deducted fifty thousand though. No, they're, they're just coincidentally both $50,000. You have a $50,000 credit and a $50,000 recoverable lien. So you oh. actually have $100,000 <laughs> available to make payment for your future liability. Okay. So okay. your future liability is $86,400. You have available to you to, to make payment for that future liability, a holiday of $50,000 and a recoverable lien of $50,000 total of $100,000, and 
And so if you, you could accept a lien recovery of $13,600 as um, a Section 32 agreement on this case. Where you lost me is when you're recovering a lien, it's monies that you've already paid. You're not going to get a lien on projected um, schedule loss of use. That's where you lost me. So if you have a recoverable lien, I mean, at the, I'm, I'm assuming that when you have a third party settlement, you have not paid out the schedule loss of use. Okay, so, so in this case, when you recover the lien, it's what you pay to date. Right. Correct. And in this example, I am, I, I've, I've included as facts in this example, not only that you have a recoverable lien of $50,000, but that the claimant also pocketed $50,000. So in addition to right. your lien of $50,000, you also have a credit of, into the future of $50,000 for a total right. available to you for payment against your future liability a $50,000 credit and a $50,000 lien recovery if the claimant would be willing to accept a lien reduction as part of an overall Section 32 agreement. All right, I, I, maybe I need to talk, talk online, offline to you about this one because in my way of thinking, and I could be wrong, you have, you, you've recovered a lien of $50,000 because you paid in excess of $50,000 on this claim and you don't have a schedule loss of use paid yet, correct? So at the time of the third party settlement, you've get, you recovered $50,000 on what you've already paid, which is, was exclusive of the schedule loss of use. Am I correct so far? Um, sort of, except that in your language, you're assuming that the carrier actually recovered the lien and what I'm using these examples oh, okay. for. Okay, that's where I'm off, yeah. Right, is to demonstrate that you could use the amount of your recoverable lien at the time of a settlement instead of taking back that lien, use that, gotcha. use a lien reduction as part of the consideration for 32. So okay. that, that's Got probably it where we're getting yeah. mixed up. Okay, exactly. cool. So let's move on because I have just one more Burns example and then I'd like to do a global settlement example. Let's assume that you have a recoverable lien of $100,000. Your net settlement, the net settlement amount, the amount that the claimant actually puts in his pocket, the credit will be $200,000 with the recoverable lien of $100,000. And again, these are numbers that I just fabricated. There's no, there's no way that you could calculate how I got to $100,000 or $200,000 in this example. They're just, they're just, I'm just asking you to assume those facts. Assume that there's a cost of litigation of 33 and a third. The claimant's been per classified with a permanent partial disability at $600 per week, 75% LWAC, and at the time of the recovery, again, 100 weeks out of the 400 have elapsed. And in this example, you have a CMS-approved MSA of $60,000. So in other words, this example is similar to the first example we looked at, but I'm asking you to include some medical experience because a Burns obligation could be requested against medical expenses as you are relieved of having to pay for those expenses. So what lien recovery or cash payment should you be willing to make in this example in order to settle this claim by Section 32? I'd say 60,000. I calculated that by, um, oh, guess I'm wrong. Well, <laughs> I've already had an error in calculation, so let's go through it together. We have a recoverable lien of $100,000, so that means we have $100,000 to pay toward um, a future, a, a Section 32 agreement, and we have a credit of $200,000. We claim it's PPD at $600 a week, 75% LWAC, 100 weeks remain out of 400. So we have 300 weeks remaining. We have our burns obligation against that weekly benefit of $200 a week. Okay, that's where my error was. So our burns obligation on the indemnity is going to be the same $60,000 from our first example. Okay, so our, our obligation on this claim for future expenses, our burns contribution against the indemnity is $60,000. Our Burns obligation on the medical 
will be a third of the $60,000, so an additional $20,000. So the $60,000 Burns contribution for the indemnity plus the $20,000 Burns contribution for the medical gives us a total future Burns obligation of $80,000. There's a sufficient amount of credit to absorb the future payments, and so we would take our recoverable lien of $80,000 or $100,000 minus our future Burns obligation of $80,000 and it would be reasonable to accept a lien recovery of $20,000 to do a section 32 in this example. Got it. Let's put it all together. Okay, so to start from the beginning with your, um, when you're looking at your third party recovery and settlement, the, the numbers that you need to really know in order to calculate this, the amount of a section 32 that you'd be willing to do are the cost of litigation, the amount of your recoverable lien, the net settlement to the claimant, or the credit, or the offset of the holiday, whatever terminology you like to use except for lien, your expected future liability, including any burdens obligation, and then that will give you your Section 32 amount. Okay, so here's our global example. Let's assume that your gross lien is $100,000, the gross amount of the settlement is $300,000, there are costs associated with obtaining this recovery of a for a total of $105,000, and that's attorney's fees of $100,000, which is a third of $300, and disbursements of $5,000 for a total of $105,000. Let's assume that the claimant has an expected, expected classification of a 50% LWEC, which would entitle him to 300 weeks of PPD benefits. The average weekly wage is $750, and let's assume that the weekly rate is $250 a week. Let's also assume that there's a CMS approved MSA for future medical of $67,857.14. What amount would, should you be willing to accept as a lien recovery, as a reduced lien, or as a cash payment? So in other words, wipe out your entire lien and contribute additional cash in order to settle this example as a section 32. Oops, sorry about that. So we know the cost of litigation is 35% even. Right. So the first thing we want to, one of the first things you'll do is determine your cost of litigation. So that's disbursements plus attorney's fees, $105,000 divided by the gross settlement of $300,000, which gives you a percent cost of litigation of 35%. So your recoverable lien is going to be what? times 35. Correct. $100,000 less $100,000 times 35%, which would be $100,000 minus $35,000. So again, you can think of that as your attorney's, the, the attorney's fees associated with your lien recovery. So your recoverable lien will be $65,000. Right. What's the future indemnity look like? Um, we got the full 300 weeks to 75,000. Right. So the expected future indemnity is $75,000, 300 weeks at $250 a week for a total indemnity, expected future indemnity payment of $75,000. The Burns obligation on that would be that times 35.35. Right, so $26,250. $26, okay. $26,250. Okay. Plus the, the MSA. Burns obligation on the MSA would be $67,000. 67, times 0.35, right? Correct, which is 23750 Add it together. Add those together. So your future expected liability on this case will be $50,000 and subtract that from your recoverable lien of $65,000. And it would be reasonable under these facts to accept 
lien recovery of $15,000 in order to settle the case by a section 32 agreement. So we did, we okay. separately added up what our um, 0.35% for both indemnity and future medical and that's how we came to our 50,000. Correct. Is that recoverable? Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we subtracted right. the 50 from the $65,000. Recoverable lien. So right. So recovery right. still 15,000 left. Okay. Right. So in other words, you t instead of getting back $65,000, you accept a lien. And, and again, you get paid still $15,000. Claimant pays you $15,000. And you can get a full and final settlement of your, 30, of your um, workers' compensation claim. And the way that we um, effectuate these settlements is we require claimants um, either their comp attorney or the third party attorney to hold the difference between the recoverable lien and what you're willing to accept as part of a 32 agreement. So like in this example, it would be the fifth, you know, the, the, the $65,000 less like the $50,000. So they hold the $50,000, the difference in, um, escrow, um, the, actually the entire thing, the $65,000 in escrow pending finalization of the section 32. And then they cut the check of $15,000 to you and the $50,000, they release those funds to the claimant. And that ends up being the consideration for the section 32 agreement. And we include language in the 32, which if there's a you know late payment, it has to go against claimant's um, attorney and not against the carrier or the employer. Cause obviously at that point you don't have control over when the funds get released. But you, I mean, Melissa, some, a, a question. Yeah. Um, when, when you're considering a global settlement, I mean, is there any consideration to what you've paid to date and whether or not you want to be relieved of the full lien amount because you paid in excess of the, you know, obviously of the lien? You know what I'm saying? I mean, is there any consideration? Is if the future, put it this way, if the future exposure is less than what you've paid to date and what you can recover? Would you want a global settlement? Um, so in other words, you might have to make a cash payment. Um, so in other words, your, the lien that you've paid to date is not sufficient to cover the future obligation you would have on the, on the workers comp claim. And I'm just wondering because it, it, we're, you know, never mind, never mind. I just worked it out in my own head. Okay. <laughs> Um, third party issues are, they're confusing, but, uh, it's also the kind of thing. And, and when I first started learning it, it was like, I would, I would feel like I grasped it for like a minute or two and then it would be gone. Um, and, but the more I, you know, it's one of those things where you just, if you keep working with it and keep working with it, you, you develop, um, an expertise in it. And it's really a, a pretty fun area of the law because um, you know like I, I believe that everybody on this presentation today um, has as much or more knowledge than most people have following today's presentation and hopefully you were able to attend Monday's presentation as well than anybody than 95 percent of the people in the state on this particular issue um, so it's it's definitely worth it to struggle with it to, to grasp the concepts because it puts you at a very um, strong advantage over um, you know, other people that you're going to deal with on this issue. Melissa, I think I know the answer to the question already, but uh, I assume that uh, if a person is getting a, a, a PPD that's capped at less than 76%, we kind of know what the payment's going to be, but that's still considered speculative because of potential changes. In oh, the well, that's a very good point, Mark. Um, <laughs> you know, when Burns first was decided back in 2007, that was right when the reforms happened. And so um, my feeling was uh, was that it was going to enjoy very short-lived um, applicability because, uh, and especially now with the 2017 reforms, where we've done away with um, arguments um, about labor market attachment. So that's attachment, yeah, yeah, that's re that's actually removed um, one of the um, primary criteria that the court relied on in deciding burns and in, in determining that the future benefits were speculative. Um, and the fact is that upon classification, we now have carriers who are required to make deposits into the aggregate trust fund. And so certainly 
Um, there's a much, I think, stronger and different argument today about um, PPD classifications with respect to the future speculative nature of those benefits than there was back in 2007 when I argued Burns. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I doubt, I think that um, it's quite likely that if somebody litigated this issue, that a court would find that if the claimant has been classified with having a permanent partial disability benefit and there are no um, factors like lack of labor market attachment, which could still make those future benefits variable, obviously, because if somebody's not attached at the time of classification, then they're not entitled to a future benefit at that point. And, you know, trying to determine that future benefit would still be speculative. But in, in the regular situation, if the person's not, if they're attached, they're going to be entitled to a set amount of weeks of benefits powering a return to work. And I think the argument that those benefits are um, speculative is a lot, a lot it's, it's, a, it's not as compelling now as it was back then. Yeah. Okay. But certainly for cases where you, I mean, you know, it's not, I would say generally that, um, when it, at the time of you that you're obtaining a recovery that a claimant's obtaining a recovery on a third party action the claimant has not yet been classified okay. i mean but that's just sort of anecdotal in my my experience in dealing with these kinds of things okay. Okay, very good well great well thank you everybody for your participation today I'm, i know we went over and i appreciate everybody's attentiveness and um, if I can answer any questions for anybody on any specific claim that you have, I'd be happy to go through it with you. Um, please stay tuned for our presentations next month. Um, I believe that we are going to be talking about Section 32 agreements uh, as part of our basic uh, webinar series. And we are also um, planning on getting the, the LOMAD players together and um, doing a presentation, um, I believe, of like a, a mock trial type of thing. Uh, where we will bring together some of the concepts that we've been discussing all year during the webinar series. So we hope you enjoy that. So thanks again. I appreciate it. And um, again, if I can answer anybody's questions, please feel free to contact me after the presentation. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you.